Communication Untangled with Sue Keo, Episode 1, Untangling Brand. Take a walk through Waitrose or the V&A Museum and without realising, you'll be seeing Harry Pierce's work. He's a graphic designer from celebrated design studio Pentagram who are behind the brand identities for names that I think you might recognise. Channel 4, Reddit, Rolls Royce, it just goes on and on. He's the perfect person to talk to about how you develop the visual language around a brand and the importance of creating clear guidelines to underpin the whole thing. Along the way, we take a look at NASA and find out how their brand has gone from a meatball to a worm. I met Harry on a busy Thursday lunchtime at Pentagram Studios in West London. We kicked off by talking about all those tiny little details that make us recognise a brand without us even consciously realising that we're doing so. Everything you're touching and making and doing as a designer when you're working on these brands comes with huge responsibility that you're sending out triggers all the time and a little change can send out a huge signal. You have to understand the implications of those things. If you pick up um, a bag of rice from Waitrose and it's their own brand rice what you know all the little cues that go into the, make you feel that this is genuine Waitrose this is my what I imagine and love about this this brand and why I'm picking up this bag of rice and that's so much to do with typography imagery color the attitude and the finesse of the, of the detail of how the typography is displayed to you that can be a signal that you just, you don't sit and work out, you just feel it. You just feel the elegance of something. And the consistency of that that, that approach on any brand is, is so important. And then when you know it's working, this is when you don't notice it, isn't it? That's, I, I think that's kind of, you know, just how it should be. It, it shouldn't be something you have to decipher. It's something that just um, intuitively happens. It's like arriving in a country. You feel the nature of that country as you arrive. Just, I've just sort of flown back from... Rome last night and I'd, you know, land in Rome and it doesn't take very much to just pick up those triggers that, you know, oh, I feel, mm. this feels like the Rome I know, you know, and a, a brand, the familiarity and the authenticity of a brand is, is, it's all those same things. It's like, you know, nations have flags for good reason. You know, a flag is a part of a visual language. It's the same when you, when you look at a brand, it's got its own series of flags that, 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 that are calling out to you to say, recognize me, I stand for something. And if they are maintained and presented in a consistent way, that becomes part of our sub, you know, subconscious. And we, and we just move through this world of stuff with those little subconscious triggers going off around us. And you feel a good feeling or a bad feeling or a, you know, a, an affinity. And would you say this is why we feel a bit upset? So if a brand that is a favourite of ours, if that changes in some way, and something is removed, like, for example, a football club, if someone messes with the crest, sure. you know, because we get very emotionally attached to it, but maybe up until that point, we hadn't realised, we, we hadn't really paid attention to the mm -hmm. brand itself. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and it's surprisingly how emotionally invested we become in things, whether that's a football club or, a, a, you know, a, I can remember when I, I, there's a series of books that I loved that were re, sort of republished years later with a, with a new approach to the covers and they just didn't resonate with me at all. And it kind of, I felt it, but it was a, almost a betrayal of the author in a way. So the more emotionally invested folk become, clearly, you know, that, that the, the effect it has on them is, is greater. But also things just can't stand still. So to keep a brand or an institution or a cultural thing alive, of course it has to, it, it needs to be sort of massaged and cared for and, and keeping in step with its time or else even the faithful will begin to lose the connection. So how do you manage that yourself? Is it an instinctive thing? Is it something that you have built into your discovery processes? Is there some sort of framework you use that will help you decide, okay, what do we keep, what do we lose? If you look at a brand and it has a colour and everybody you know, has that colour in their head, that to even begin to question why you'd want to change that. Businesses are, are, are faced with constant challenges. So, you know, a business might be failing and that business has worked out why it's failing and knows why it needs to change. And sometimes a rebrand is to signal that things aren't, you know, so you make a, you make a big change in identity to say, okay, we, we, were the, we were failing, the world knows we're failing. Our behavior internally has changed. We have to signal to you all that that old behavior is no more, that this new behavior, and we've put it right, is represented by this new visual language. Clearly the name itself, 
you have a logotype or a word mark so that you know wh how that that name is actually written and displayed often there's a separate thing which would be a symbol which could be part of that word mark which is extracted and then made to be something or it could be an entirely different mark in its own right it's a bit like nike and the swoosh two entirely different things go off and do very different jobs sometimes they come together sometimes they work in um independently with many brands there will be a signature color that you that you recognize colors go in and out of fashion and they and they're terribly terribly subjective i think it's one of the hardest things i find working on identities is color because people have such strong feelings about the triggers in those colors there would be an approach to typography i know we're going to talk a little bit about liberty in a while but you know something like a brand like liberty it is a specific home grown crafted font that's theirs that's protected so that again if that's used with enough, enough consistency and joy and and relish that it, you know it's 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 used with pride and love it becomes synonymous with the brand and it's another another really valuable trigger and that's something that's grown and grown in the last 20 years as the ability for people to to economically design you know fonts for for global for global or even even small little brands it's become more and more of a of a of a powerful tool and then there's the visual language itself which is actually how all those things to come together and behave so visual expression is a, is a is a sort of visual representation of the deepest truth of the soul of something that's it at its finest point if you can get to that that when you make things people just feel the heart of this thing every time you do something so can we talk a little bit about brand mm, guidelines mm. and particularly for people who some people are in the industry so they use them all the time they know what we're talking about but maybe if you're you're not what what are brand guidelines how do they function why are they so important well they are the final things to get made you've had all this time of experimentation and visualization of the whole thing to find its place and its feeling it's about then building a set of principles that hold all that together so they would take all those different elements they would take the logo the color the typography the symbol if there is one the tone of voice which is which is another important part of this even down to sound and smell can be written up in there as well it's the collective bible of of what needs to be adhered to to make this thing go out and function and the sort of minutiae of detail you get into is there may be pages and pages and pages just on a single color working out how it would appear on screen on fabric on a piece of stone on a on a carved into wood on um a piece of print just on that color and how on earth so if you think of something like uh Tiffany which Pentagram in New York rebranded many years ago there's a huge amount of time spent on how do we maintain the quality of that gorgeous color that everyone knows when you say Tiffany we you see in your head right now isn't it you know if that's being printed in India China uh, wherever or in or in New York when that all comes together because often these things would be there'd be something made in one country and a, a label in another and they'd all arrive up in the same packaging I know that's what's happened here. How do you know that that whole that whole color is going to come together and be the same thing when it does? Because if it doesn't, the love and the, the precision of that brand just starts to fall apart a little bit. Now, if you take that for color, that same principle applies to every other part of this. How does that word mark logo um, logotype? How does the typography is very complex because that gets used in so many different. ways and forms even to animation you know what's the what's that what's the speed the energy the depth the the way that that word image changes in its movement is just the same as maintaining the quality of a color globally i'm really keen to hear more from you about lbty mm. new range of gender neutral fragrances for liberty london so we're talking about brand guidelines today and how you kind of maintain that brand story and brand presence kick off by telling me what what was the brief that they came to you with they were talking um about the idea of them actually having uh, a beauty brand and in that conversation it was mentioned that the la back in the 1950s they actually had a fragrance brand that was the last time they had a fragrance of their own and that just went, wow that's the then maybe that's the first step 
that there could be a fragrance, that then there could be other beauty products. And there's, there, there are a lot of ideas of, of, of the, this the expanding. So really it's a beauty brand, not just a fragrance brand. However, the fragrance is the, f the first thing that's, that's appearing. And I, I, I was convinced that if you just stick Liberty on it, it'll just be an, a Liberty owned brand product. That, that this idea needed to, to be more of a, a sort of brand of its, in, in, its, in its own right. So that's where it came from, the LBTY, came from the fact that I'd seen in the archives uh, uh, some, some lovely little shorthands of the old identity. That yeah. When it was Liberty & Co, it was a gorgeous little bit of type of LBT & Co or something like this with a little dot underneath it. And so we took that and then we redrew this as a special mark in its own right. It's meant to be there as a, a little bit of a, a sort of alternative behavior mm -hmm. to, to, to the regular stuff they do. And if you have that, it gives another, another impetus and energy to the brand. What are the risks if people don't use brand guidelines then? Do you, do you often find that people go rogue? Sure. They say, I, you know, I know this brand, I know what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. I think it's simply brand damaging. It, design is such a powerful thing. It can be just as damaging as it is a, a positive influence on something. There's another thing that can come into it. If, if a designer's ego, it, it, their, their self-expression for them becomes more important than adhering to the rules, and I see that happen a lot, that's just damaging too. It's not about that person. It's about this collective idea that a lot of people have, you know, built based on strategy, on principles that, that, that they're going to keep this, this brand and this identity, you know, on, on, on target and online. On and it's, it's when all that falls to bits or, and it doesn't take, you can just chip away at the corners a little bit. You can get careless. It can get, um, you can just feel the lack of love. Harry will be back shortly to tell me, among other things, how he developed the brand identity for the V&A and a really cute brand of ready-made cocktails. But let's think back for a moment to the word brand itself. So, of course, years and years ago, it was all about branding livestock or you had craftsmen who would stamp their name or their symbol onto goods that they'd made. Things have evolved a little bit from there. So in the 15th century came the printing press and then the first ad appeared in an English newspaper in 1625. Then we move into the hugely commercial 20th century with the rise of Heinz, Coca-Cola and Ford cars whose brands are still going strong today. Graphic design played a huge part in this. With this came brand guidelines to create a clear set of rules to make sure everyone kept everything consistent and also to protect the brand from other people stealing the designs. A great example of the evolution of a brand identity is NASA. Their first logo, a planet-shaped blue, red and white design that everybody called the meatball, came into being in 1959. And then in 1975 came a new logo called the worm. If you look online, you can see the graphic standards manual, which tells you how it should be placed on everything from a t-shirt to a space shuttle. And now if you look at nasa.gov, you can see how the brand has evolved and expanded even further in line with the demands of the digital age. So it tells people how it can be legally used in images, film, merchandise and big bucks brand partnerships. OK, let's go back to Harry and bring things back down to earth. I do notice that whenever there is a re big rebrand, you do get lots of armchair critics. Oh, I can see Nazi <laughs> symbols in it. What, what, when you launch a new brand, do you kind of, do you just kind of ignore all of that? Or do you listen to the feedback out there? Or, um, you know, how do you feel when it actually goes um, live and out into the wild? I, I mean, especially with the, with the way things like the social media works, that it's people can just, you know, with no expertise can just exactly. fire any, old, and, well, it also can be as unpleasant as hell. And, and so I, I've actually, um, I actively disengage with it because I think you have to believe in what you've made. You know, the journey that you went on and, and, and it's exhaustive, usually, you know, it's been researched, it's been put through the mill a dozen times to, to, to prove the rights and wrongs or something. So if you work with sincerely, then you can stand by what you do. And I think if you know you're not working sincerely, then those things will, will knock you. But uh, I just rather not engage. I mean, I, 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 you could spend your time just drowning in a sea of voices of <laughs> Of either positivity or, or criticism. Yes. So I guess it's a bit like actors and people who, you know, don't read the reviews of their, you know, first nights. And I think this must be where the brand story is so important, because if there's a story behind it giving context to the design, 
then that, that's the explanation for it, isn't it? And you can say to people, mm. well, well, this is why we've used this typeface. Mm. So with LBTY, it's drawn from the original, was it over the sign that was over the, uh, well, no, the door, so, is so that right? Liberty itself, the, 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 the logo for Liberty, is a, is a, is a modern take on, on um, a very close relationship to the, the original word Liberty written over the door when they first opened. And I found that in the archive and we took it from an old sign and we just contemporized it. So it has a very authentic foundation. LBTY is that same word, but we've just, we've just obviously just taken those characters and, and just reconstituted them into a, into a, into a little, you know, a, a monogram in a way, but using it in a big, bold way. And just tell me about the guidelines underpinning all of this then. So if you've been working with Liberty for a number of years yeah. on different projects, yeah. what do they look like? Is it, are they printed out? Do you, can you hold these, them in your the, hand? The, these are, the, are they online? Sure, what sure. Are they, what's, what's in them? It's, it's, like, it's a bit like a written book, picture book, with diagrams and um, introductory text, diagrams, detailed little zoom-ins on details and telling you exactly how to, to set things and whatever. That's one form. I mean, and, and it's probably about 150 pages long, the full thing. For instance, there's a large global identity that we're, we're just finishing. That's going to be entirely digital. There won't be any printed. And there's, there's a couple of guys in New York who have created this thing called Standards, which is a um, brilliant interactive guideline platform. So if you can imagine, you can mix live film and all of that into a guideline just more dynamic and inspiring. And then that means it's more likely to be implemented well at yeah. the other end as well, which is what the goal is at the end of the day. Yeah, and it simultaneously sits on a hub. So anyone in the world can draw down from different countries and use that mm. and share and talk with each other, you know, can, so it's, it's a quite a brilliant thing. And how much do you get involved with the tone of voice side? So I know um, like the V&A, the mm. museum in London, but then also other parts of the UK mm. as well. I was looking through the brand guidelines for them and I did see a bit even about how you write the descriptions in a gallery and the tone sure. of voice and that kind sure. of thing. So how do you ensure that the, the visual side flows through to the, the written side? Yeah, for the V&A project, the way, the way it was worked, the, the, there was a typeface created by um, another designer and then different people took the different museums. So for instance, I took South Ken and we all use those same set of typographic principles and built different characterizations for the different museums. So obviously young v and could be more playful, childlike, colorful. The typography actually got changed to be very specific for that. But what happened is we, we had little working sessions with ourselves, the V&A, and one of the other people right here who's a, who's a writer, and they all, we all began together. So the language, the visual, and the, and the sort of identity work all grew simultaneously. Everyone thinks visual, and you forget actually that every word is actually being crafted. Hand in hand. And, yeah, 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 yeah. The sort of projects you work on, they're, they're really big scale. So we're talking about John Lewis, and we're talking about Liberty, and we're talking about Pink Floyd, and, sure. and all of these, these uh, big names. So if you were just starting out, so let's say you create a startup and then build your own business. Mm. What are those kind of essential component parts that should go into the brand? So if you don't have a mega budget to spend, you know, what, what are those essentials? I mean, first I should just say it, those that you see, all those, all those big <laughs> names, there are far more smaller, yeah. humble, mm. wonderful projects that we're working on simultaneously too. And I, and I make no differentiation in the amount of dedication of time and uh, an, an approach to anything. I mean, it could be the most tiny little pro bono thing for someone that you're just doing. That doesn't get any less energy. So um, for a startup, I think getting clarity of essentially who you are and why what you're doing is different to anyone else is a kind of, you need that foundation. You've got to have that place. You may need, you may need help to fight, to define what that place is, but you need that point of a, of a, of a springboard for people to start to, to kind of work with. And, and we've just we've been working with a, I, I, they, they, they did exist before, but they were almost like a startup, a company called Moth Drinks, mm -hmm. and they weren't called Moth before, and they, they, were, they were just getting going. We said, you've got to forget the name. They're the little tins of uh, yeah. like alcoholic. Yeah, um, cocktails, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, 
what's interesting there is that they had a brand and it, they, they knew things weren't right. We said, you've got to change the bottle, change the name of the actual business. And they did everything. And, it's, and it's been, they've been so brave and brilliant. And that project, you couldn't really separate the language and the design. They're, 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 they are one and the same thing. And the, and the kind of entertainment that's in the language mm. is the spirit of who these folk are. Actually, I've bought one of those before, and even the, the tin itself is kind of uh, textured, isn't it? We've just noticed other people started doing exactly the right. same with little tin So drinks. people don't drop their cocktail, isn't it? Yeah, well, when you get a slippery <laughs> hand, yeah. But it's, it's, um, but it's important to pick up and feel, oh, this feels different. And when they, when they started to get, they've been going about three years now, when they started to really expand three years with this rebrand, that it would have been economically really easy to lose that rough sandpapery feel. It would have been so easy. And there was pressure to do that, and they didn't. So that would be built into the brand guidelines as well, even the, the textures, I suppose. You, know, you notice that, and we're talking about that. So it shows you it matters. 99% of any other tin you pick up wouldn't probably have that. So losing that, you slip back into the mass of other tins. Yeah, just uh, the same as everybody yeah, else. And, and, and you can apply that same principle to every part of this. Have you ever had any of those moments where you've done the rebrand or the design a few years ago and then you see it out in the world now a few years on and you're thinking, oh, you know, the, the logo's always in the wrong place or there, there's something that's never implemented correctly once it's gone, gone live? Not everything goes out perfectly. And, and I think you get used to the fact that if, the, if, the, if the, the greater percentage is out there and it's true, you're fine with it. And of course you see little things that go, just kind of break your heart, but... What you also have to realize is that this is a transitory thing, largely. That the way that this culture works is about, there is a sense of constant change. And you can, you know, I, when we read the, the John Lewis identity, one of the other partners here did it 20 years prior. One of my great mentors had, had done it and then he saw me change it and he changed it from someone else 20 years prior to that. So there is a sense of constant change and it's interesting the ones that, even the ones you think, so if you, if you, if you, if you think of the brands that you grew up with and knew so well and everything, I'd be really surprised if they haven't been quietly changing, but you still recognize them. They just feel like they change with you. What struck me in this conversation with Harry is that although he has all these big names in his portfolio that he could shout about if he chose to, he gives exactly the same dedication and care to the smaller ones which might slip under the radar. I think this is so important when we're thinking about our own visual projects. Someone said to me recently, how you do one thing is how you do everything, and I think that's so true. If you take care in the way that you design guidelines for a brand which is small and beautiful, you'll be well placed to do this on a much larger scale. And of course, if you're sloppy in your approach behind the scenes, so you're not putting handbooks and guidelines and expectations in place, then things quickly go off the rails. The thing about a strong brand is that when it's good, it's intuitive, and then when something's not right, it's jarring. So, to my mind, it's about getting the balance right between not being too dictatorial and giving people a clear framework in which they can operate. All this put together reinforces a strong brand identity, which will be consistent from your internal company culture all the way through to the packaging, the billboards, magazine ads, the logo and the copy itself. And if you're a small company just starting out or a mega global corporation with years of heritage behind you, it's these small details that can make all the difference in gaining recognition and loyalty from your customers. I'm so grateful to Harry Pierce from Pentagram for taking time out to help me untangle brand. My name is Sue Keogh and editing and audio production on the Communication Untangled podcast comes from Rob Burney at Made by DBM. We have all the show notes on my company website, so just head to sukio.com slash podcast, and that's S-O-O-K-I-O dot com slash podcast. And of course, please subscribe, and I would just love it if you gave us a perfectly formed like, an eye-catching five-star rating, or a beautifully worded review.